I'm going to discuss reentry tachycardias. I'm not going to talk about all of the tachyarrhythmias, just the reentry circuit. This is a slow motion animation of the electrical conduction on the heart. It begins at the SA node, travels around the atria, down the AV node to the ventricles, and now repolarization. In the AV node, there are two pathways, a fast pathway and a slow pathway, described here in blue, the fast pathway, and here in brown, we see the slow pathway. Signals can come in through these fibers, or they can come in through these fibers. The fast pathway also has a slow repolarization, whereas the slow conduction pathway repolarizes rapidly. When the signal comes in, it comes around the fast pathway down to the ventricles. However, it's also moving down the slow pathway. It collides with the information coming around this way, and virtually nothing happens. I'm going to show that one more time. In this animation, what we're seeing is there's the fast pathway, here's the slow pathway. We've set up a loop. It's coming down the slow pathway, up the fast pathway, back down, and up again. So the information is now coming down into the ventricles and simultaneously heading up into the atria. As a result, we will probably see no P wave or the P wave may in fact occur after the QRS. And depending on lead placement, the P wave may also be inverted. In this animation, I'm going to be showing the beginnings of this reentry circuit. We're starting with a premature atrial contraction, but as we can see, the AV node has not yet repolarized. Here it is in slow motion. It's moving around, coming up this way, comes back around, comes back in. Here it is running continuously in slow motion. See it coming up and around, comes back around, enters the slow pathway, exits the fast pathway, simultaneously coming down into the ventricles. There's another anomaly called the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And in this animation, I'm showing an accessory pathway. This is conductive tissue connecting the atria to the ventricles, but without the delay that we normally see in the AV node. So we see it starting, it comes down, there's some pre-excitation right there. That pre-excitation causes the mean electrical axis to shift to the left in this case. This is a right-sided both parkinson white accessory pathway, or the bundle of Kent. It can also occur on the left side. In this example, the mean electrical axis will be moved to the left. It's normally running in this direction, but because of this pre-excitation, it moves it in this direction. The pre-excitation also causes a delta wave. Here in this blue, we see the QR part of the QRS, but it's overwhelmed by the delta wave. And the delta wave is the result of this pre-excitation. This myograph, this pre-excitation right here, appears as this delta wave, and it overwhelms the QRS, or the Q portion of the QRS. Now, this can go wrong, usually because of a premature contraction. In this example, we're coming down. Moving back up, we come through the bundle of Kent, back around, and through. This is an extreme slow motion. Come around, and we set up a loop. This is an orthodromic loop because it's coming from the ventricles through the accessory pathway back down through the AV node. An antidromic loop can also occur in which it comes back up this way, down through the bundle of Kent, and then back up through the AV node. That is more rare. One of the techniques used to correct this system is called RF ablation. In this procedure, you place a catheter with a tip that can be heated by high-frequency radio waves. That heat will then destroy the tissue and leave behind scar tissue. 
Let me do that one more time. The tip is heated. Scar tissue is left behind. This procedure can also work on the slow pathway in an AV nodal reentry tachycardia. There is a new procedure which is becoming more popular, and that's cryoablation. In that system, we freeze this tissue. One of the problems with radiofrequency ablation is that you may accidentally destroy the normal pathway requiring the patient to be put on a pacemaker. With the cryoablation technique, we can freeze this region right here, the slow pathway, to about minus 10. If the normal circuit fails, we can then rewarm the tissue and try again. Once we've discovered that we've successfully destroyed only the slow pathway, we can bring the temperature down to minus 70 and permanently destroy that pathway. Atrial flutter is often considered a re-entry tachycardia, although it is not re-entry in the strictest of senses. Atrial flutter occurs, once again, because of a premature contraction. The most common form occurs in the right atrium and is counterclockwise. A rarer form causes a clockwise rotation, and even more rarely we will see the circuit occurring in the left atrium. So here we see the circuit coming around, and there's a slow pathway right here in orange coming back up again and then running down through the AV node to the ventricles. This slow pathway between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid valve is important in setting up this loop. I'll show that once again. Slow pathway right here. Entering the AV node down into the ventricles. Over here I'm showing the electrocardiogram. Here we have the P waves. These are the flutter waves. And in this case, every third P wave triggers a QRS. And that's because there's a delay in the AV node. The slow AV nodal pathway allows this circuit to come around two or three or more times before finally getting through the AV node because of its long refractory period. Atrial flutter can cause atrial contractions up to 350 beats per minute. However, we may only see 100, 150 beats per minute in the ventricles because of this delayed circuit right here. This can come around two or three or four times before finally coming through the AV node. Reentry tachycardias can occur anywhere there's a branching circuit. In this example, this could be the left and right bundle branches. They could be for Kinji branch work. In a normal circuit, this comes down, passes through both branches, crosses over, and collides somewhere in the middle because if each side is in its refractory period, when they crash, the signal cannot cross. In this example, I'm showing a complete branch block. An infarct could have destroyed some of the conductive tissue. So the signal comes down. It can't get through the block. comes back around. Eventually, will reach all areas of the heart. Well, this is, does not create a, a serious cardiovascular problem. However, it will move the mean electrical axis, in this case, toward the left, because this is on the left branch. Here we have a unidirectional retrograde reentry circuit. This blockage right here allows the signal to pass retrograde, that is, up in this direction, but not anterograde down in this direction. So it's unidirectional, it's retrograde, and the third requirement for this circuit to work is that this must be a very slow pathway. So the destruction in this area must have produced a slower conducting pathway. And this will just loop around and around and around. Ventricular tachycardias in the range of 250 beats per minute are not uncommon. Well, I'm going to get a little bit silly here, and I'm going to make an analogy. Let's assume we have a bicycle. It's moving toward the ramp. It's going to slow down as it moves up the ramp and then jump across. Well, that seems so good. Let's try going back the other way and see what happens. I've censored the rest of this because it, uh, it was a pretty gruesome fall. Well, that seems like a silly analogy, but in fact, it's very much the way the system works. We know very little about the biophysics of this slow unidirectional conduction pathway. Some have suggested there's an asymmetric conduction system in that pathway, such that there are fewer voltage-gated channels on one side compared with the other. So the signal cannot get through one way, but can get through the opposite direction. 
Well, that concludes this talk. I'm going to leave this up here so you can look at it if you wish, discussing those things I just mentioned about reentry circuits.